L-I-P-L-M. Hello, my name is Brandon Carter. I'm an application engineer with Ally PLM Solutions. Hope everyone is doing well. I want to welcome all of you to our Ally PLM NX Lunch Bite series. I think most of our viewers probably know what Lunch Bites are, but if you happen to be new, Lunch Bites are sessions we do where we cover a topic, command, or tool that users may not be aware of. We want to take a look at what's new in NX11 CAD. NX11 was released in August. We broke this topic into two sessions. We've already completed part one of our discussion a couple weeks ago. Today we'll conclude part two. Our goal today is to give you some insight on what's new in NX11 CAD. There are many more items that are new, but we're going to focus on some of the items that will help with productivity and our everyday type tools, no matter what types of parts and assemblies uh, you design. So as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, we completed part one. We looked at what's new in user interface, sketching, modeling, and synchronous modeling. In this session, we're going to look at what's new with sheet metal assemblies, drafting slash PMI, and a couple of other items that I'd like to mention. So for sheet metal, we're going to look at some advanced flange enhancements. We're going to look at the joggle and lightning cutout. Not that they're necessarily new, but how they're packaged now. Um, bridge bend enhancements and flattening and forming. So the advanced flange, there's a flat pattern adjustment option. I'll show you that in a demonstration here in a minute. And also there's a two reference option and also an option with two reference where you can infer length. So you'll see down here we can create an advanced flange up to a surface. Think of uh, something like a replace face where we say take this face and go to this surface this will do that whenever you create the advanced flange joggle lightning cutout is now part of advanced sheet metal aerospace sheet metal has been retired and it's been replaced and improved and kind of consolidated inside of advanced sheet metal group in the toolbar um, aerospace flange is now just called advanced flange and basically it's one command now, advanced flange. Aerospace joggle is now just called joggle. Aerospace lightning cutout is now just lightning cutout. Unform and reform, the functionality associated with those tools is now just included in unbend and rebend. Um, if you look at the lower left screenshot, just kind of how everything was packaged in the toolbar between NX9 and NX10, the advanced sheet metal down there. And then over here you see in the middle the NX910 aerospace sheet metal group or toolbars and now in NX11 everything consolidated under an advanced um, group there. The joggle command, um, like I said it's uh, part of advanced sheet metal now. Um, some enhancements associated with that as well, no longer limited to just a flan I'm sorry, advanced flanges only. Supports datum planes that do not intersect bends. So you see even if the, the um, plane doesn't go all the way across the bend, it'll, it'll work. Control over offset and depth for individual web faces. There's compensation adjustment and flat pattern, just like I said, with advanced flange. And then compensation support for nested joggles. Bridge bend. Um, for NX11, there's not really anything new with bridge bend but it's now part of the base sheet metal package. It used to only be an advanced sheet metal uh, and up. So the, the bridge bend command there where you can go and grab edge of one, one tab, for example, and, and connect it to the edge of another tab to the bridge in between there. One thing I want to point out is that they did add some functionality in 10.02 for bridge bend uh, just to kind of Make everybody aware of that. If you're not familiar with the 1002, what that means is that would be maintenance release 2 of NX10. So with this or that particular version, support for full full transition type was enhanced to add an option defined by Ben. This would allow a user to trim and extend bodies to an intersection and create that, that bridge bin automatically. So think of being able to extend or trim a surface, but in this case we're creating a bin. Flattening and forming. I talked about this in part one of what's new in NX11 Lunch Bites that I did a couple weeks ago. 
it is part of the modeling environment with the surfacing tools so if, if you want to go check that out you can um, basically if you look at a process or a workflow down here at the bottom you can take this flattening and forming tool and you see there the original shape you can flatten it just with a vector and a a hold point if you wanted to you could go ahead and build sketch items or curves or whatever it may be in that flattened state and then reform it with the um, reform option inside the flattening and forming tool so let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of those uh, tools all right here we have a two-part assembly I have a reference part here and another part called file new we're going to model a sheet metal part around that reference part let's go ahead and edit into that part and make it the work part I'm going to rotate this over and notice right now there's an interference between a dimple bead shape from the reference part through my my new sheet metal part so I need to go ahead and create a new dimple and bead to to give me the relief around that feature that I need there's nothing actually new here with the deformation features but uh, we need to do this in our part to to get the desired shape so I'm going to come over here and just grab a sketch for this dimple and right now I have a depth of uh, three millimeters on that that uh, dimple I'm also going to put some beads some strengthening beads across there let me go ahead and flip the direction so it's the same direction as the dimple now one thing I want to point out like I said it's not necessarily new but it's it's pretty neat notice the the depth I have on the, the bead is a little shorter than what I had on the dimple. If I go ahead and change this to 4 and 4 so that the depth is greater than the bead, notice how that bead, or I'm sorry, the bead is greater than the depth of the, the dimple. Notice how that automatically extends across there. So I'll go ahead and put those back a little shorter, but you see the result there, which will allow that to fit over top of our reference part. Alright, let me go ahead and get the uh, other side of my part going. So I'm just going to create a new body, a new tab, which is going to be a base feature. So now i got the top of my, my sheet metal part. And you'll notice that the, the one of the sides of this tab has this arc on here. So I want to create a flange, but more specifically I want to create an advanced flange. <clears throat> As I go through here, notice that, and I'll mention this again later, you see lightning cut out and joggle. The term aerospace has been dropped and notice how they're part of the advanced um, group of commands here. So I'm going to go to an advanced flange. Pull this off. If you haven't used advanced flange before, notice it allows me to, to put a flange on that, that curvature shape, curve shape. I can you know make some changes here just like any other flange. Length and an angle there. Go ahead and accept that. Now, one thing I want to point out that's new here, if I come back into the advanced flange, underneath settings, you'll see there's some flat pattern compensation. So if I go ahead and turn on a, a compensation value at the start, this is another parameter. Right now it's set to zero. I will adjust this here in a minute. So whenever I come up here and do a flat pattern, or in this case a flat solid, and I can come over here to a top view. Notice the flat pattern versus the original flan advanced flange. You know, there's a little bit of a difference there. So if I come back into the advanced flange, maybe add five degrees as it comes around here, notice how now it extends further. Or if I wanted to stop even shorter, I could go ahead and put something like negative five and see how it stops short. So just be aware that there's the flat pattern compensation, and you'll see that in a lot of these advanced sheet metal tools. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that flat solid and we'll continue modeling our part. Over on this other side notice how we have this construction surface. So I'm going to create another advanced flange. Go ahead and pull this up from the top here. And instead of just doing by value we can look at the option here to do reference. So what reference allows you to do is say take that advanced flange and match that surface. So that flange is going to match that contoured surface. Right now I still have length, so I can say how, in this case how tall or long I want that flange to be, but you can turn on the option infer length and notice how it automatically takes the shape of that surface for the length, which is pretty neat. 
And like I said earlier, there's the flat pattern compensation if we need it. All right, let's come over here and create a joggle. So like I said, the term aerospace been dropped from that. A joggle, if you're not familiar with the joggle, you can do a single or a twin. We'll start off here with the single. So if I come over here and grab this face, what depth do I want to be? And what you can do here with the joggle command is you can say, where do you want this joggle to be? And it uses a plane. And if you remember back from the slide, one of the enhancements we had is that the plane doesn't have to intersect um, the bend. So I'm going to come over here and grab a um, plane that I have. And what it will do is it will start to apply that shape. It's a very specific shape used a lot in aerospace. If I just play with some parameters here so you see how the shape changes. This is just a single jog, but it's a joggle because it's a closed or formed shape. There's different options here for the run out and the clearance. There's a legend here if you, if you need to see what those parameters are, are associated with. If I go ahead and change some other parameters here, let's see, I got three for, let's change this back to three for the depth, make it a little more slight offset. Go ahead and change some of these. Let's see, let's make this uh, 12 and three. That looks pretty good. So we have a, a, a single joggle. If we change this to twin, I could grab another plane and notice how it has its offset or jog, if you will, on one side and it comes back out on the other. That's what a twin does. So if I go ahead and hit OK, there's our joggle shape. Now to cap this together, right now there's two separate bodies here. I'm going to go do a bridge bend. Like I said, bridge bend is now with your basic sheet metal license. It used to be underneath advanced. So if I do a bridge bend from this edge to this edge, it'll go in there and create, create that shape. There's different options if you haven't used this before. Like I said, bridge bend is the command's not new. It's just now part of the uh, base sheet metal package. But you see options for finite, symmetric. I could say go to the start edge and make that full. I can say go to the, the end edge and make that full, or I can do full both edges, which makes it the same length here on the start edge and the same length here on the ending edge, which gives me that tapered shape. So it's a bridge idea for bends and sheet metal, just like a bridge idea in bridge curve or bridge surface over in modeling. Lightning cutout, like I said, it used to be the aerospace lightning cutout, but now it's part of the advanced um, sheet metal package. So if I come in here and I want to create a cutout about a, a sketch, you'll notice that the lightning cutout looks a lot like a drawn cutout, but it, it has a little different behavior. For example, if I come in here and, and change some parameters, you know, maybe I have this 5 and 45, maybe I'll extend this a little bit, make it a little longer change this to 90 see the different shape we get Go ahead and change this back a little bit but it's taking that profile and, and creating parameters for the lightning cutout you can also do a hole so if I come in here and grab another location you can actually have predefined cutouts or, or hole shapes associated with that so if I come in here and grab like the 55 diameter, or the 35 diameter. See how these are ghosted out because they're associated with a standard type um, shape. So anyway, there's a, a lightning cutout. Like I said, the biggest thing there is um, the aerospace sheet metal environment's been retired and everything there has been renamed and packaged underneath advanced sheet metal. We want to go ahead and create a flat pattern of this. We can couple clicks there so that's going to go ahead and create my created my flat pattern model view I'm in the context of the assembly so I'm going to go ahead and make this a displayed part and we come over here to that particular model view and make that active so you see our lightning cutouts and our our deformation features and so forth for a flat pattern so let me switch back over to the assembly 
And there's our finished part that we modeled over top of that reference. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is what's new in assemblies. We're going to look at assembly constraint limits. So enhancements to the component pattern when using the reference option. And display parent enhancements when navigating up through subassemblies. So first of all, any assembly constraint that has a value or an expression, so I guess meaning distance or angle, you can now put limits on there. So if we drive the distance outside of one of those upper or lower limits that you see in the screenshot, it'll warn us. Or we can actually have it float and have a range to move between those limits, the upper and lower limit. So like I said, same thing with the angle. So I can have it rotate, in this case, this, this valve between 0 and 90 degrees, have it rotate between, we'll say, open and close. So I'll, take a, I'll show you those two examples here in a minute. So the component pattern with reference options enhancements, you can now reference a pattern face, pattern geometry, or sketch pattern curve. Previously we could only do a pattern feature, but now it can be any of those pattern techniques. You can use a reference pattern without that component being constrained to the reference geometry, so it doesn't have to have assembly constraints to find uh, the reference. And when a component is constrained to pattern geometry, NX no longer copies the constraints. So it has fewer constraints, which helps with performance. If you remember with the component pattern when it was redone in NX9, if it had a constraint on that master part, it would go ahead and apply constraints to all the occurrences as well. So in the example I'm going to show you, you see over here in the plate where everything's patterned, I've used the pattern feature like we've done previously but I've also done pattern geometry and pattern face um, to create those, those patterns. So we'll take a look at that here in a couple minutes. And finally here, display parent enhancements. A small enhancement, but it's kind of nice to, to have this whenever you're in a particular level, maybe a subassembly or even a, a piece part within a subassembly, and you're ready to navigate back up through the assembly structure. When you right-click and display parent, the order it lists the items there, the parents, is the order that it would take to navigate all the way back up to the top level assembly. So in this case, I'm in ball bearing the part. If I look at the first in the list, that would be the subassembly that ball bearings in. And then transmission would be the subassembly that transmission thrust bearings is in. And then transmission is the subassembly that's in the drill assembly, and this happens to be a master model assembly drawing, and this would be the drawing at the top level. So the order, the list that it, that NX provides is the order it would take to get back to the top level. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few of those items. Let's come over here and let's first look at the, um, let's do the, the range, the uh, limits there. So here I have an example. I have a, uh, a cylinder. You know, this could be a pneumatic cylinder, hydraulic cylinder, whatever it may be. But obviously there's some kind of a range, a range associated with that, a travel associated with that cylinder. Here I have a 20 millimeter distance constraint. If I look at that particular uh, assembly constraint and edit it, you'll see that it was a distance constraint between a face and face in there and has a 20 millimeter offset. So what's new here in NX11 is I can come down here to distance limits and say well I want the upper limit to maybe be 40 millimeters so it moves this linkage forward and the lower limit to be 5 millimeters or 0 or whatever it may be so it stops it back at the, the bottom of its travel. Now notice the check boxes between here you can turn these on and off Right now I have them all checked. So if I come in here and type in 40, obviously it moves that forward, but if I do 45, it tells me that it's outside of that limit. So I'm still driving with this variable or this expression, this distance, but this is just telling me, hey, this is the, the limits of your travel. This is basically a, a, an alert saying don't go beyond that. The other thing we can do is actually have it move with move freely within the, the limit. So if I uncheck distance here and hit OK, 
and either within my assembly constraints or move component command and I start to drag that back and forth see how in parentheses it's stopping at my limits so everything would be free to move in between 5 and 40 if you look at the other example I have with uh, the angle constraint here I have this handle up here and I had a datum plane at the part level to this datum plane here. I'm just going to hide the, the datum planes. Let's go ahead and change my uh, reference set here back to model. So this angle constraint, if I look in here, right now it's set to 90 degrees, which is my open position. If I change this to zero, that's my closed position, just the way I have it set up. I can come in here and put limits on that and say have it go from 90 and down to 0 so if I uncheck this angle I'll then be able to rotate this part and have it stop 0 and 90 in an open and closed position so basically with, with the assembly constraints for distance and angle which has a value you can have limits and you can have them have your constraints be free between those limits. The next thing we'll take a look at here is the the pattern enhancement. So right now I just have a simple example. I have this base plate with some different patterning techniques and then a, a bolt from the reuse library in there. If I look at the plate first you'll see that the left pattern is actually a pattern feature just like we're uh, used to for component patterns anyway. I have a pattern geometry here which is just a sketch being patterned. And then I have a face that was created with synchronous and then a pattern face use. So it's not a pattern feature, it's just a face pattern. Maybe this part was imported from another CAD system and it's just a face and I went ahead and patterned it to get um, you know, multiple occurrences. So back at the assembly level, if I want to go ahead and pattern this component, a couple things we talked about on the slide, if I go to pattern component, and I grab this component and I pick reference, so we're talking specifically about reference. In this case, it picked up the pattern because that was constrained in there. That's what we're used to. But notice it no longer patterns those assembly constraints to all occurrences in the pattern. It's, it's still just on the master occurrence. If I come back to pattern component and I look at the one where we did the pattern geometry and I grab this component, I need to tell it the pattern in the reference but I can use pattern geometry it doesn't have to be pattern feature or feature pattern now and same thing over here this was the faces that I use pattern face if I come up here and do a pattern component I can select that pattern face as a pattern pick my instance for my reference so basically there's more flexibility now with different pattern feature techniques like pattern geometry, pattern face, as well as what we're used to, pattern feature. But now at the assembly and the component pattern, we can use each of those. Let me switch over to um, this particular file. This is an um, example I'll be showing you how to use some different features inside of what's new with drafting here in a few minutes. But basically what I have is some kind of a, a detailed assembly structure in a sense there's multiple levels. So I have the top level file which is my master model drawing. I have the drill assembly which is a top level assembly. And if I keep drilling down here, here's a transmission sub-assembly. Then here's a, another sub-assembly called transmission thrust bearings. And then here's a component. So if I go in here and make that child component to display part, and I do some work, I look at this or whatever it is, and I'm ready to go back to a certain level and I right click and do a display parent. Like I said, the order we have here is the order that it would take to get back to the top level from top to bottom instead of it being random. 
So if I want to go two levels up back to the transmission subassembly, now I'm at the transmission subassembly. If I want to go all the way back to the drawing, I'm all, all the way back to the drawing. And if you missed what's new in NX11 CAD Lunch Bytes, the, the part one I did a couple weeks ago, notice how it's automatically switching applications between drafting and modeling as I navigated that. All right, next thing we're going to take a look at is what's new in drafting and PMI. Uh, first thing there is a minchable item, being able to have multi-thread processing for smart, lightweight views. This helps for large assembly drawings. Track drawing enhancements, secondary geometry representations, some arrangement enhancements for drafting, view break enhancements, a whole call-out option called Create Secondary Dimension for Depth. Being able to display your PMI cutting plane in the drawing view. And be able to convert drawing or drafting objects and views over to PMI. Which is pretty, pretty neat. So first of all, the track drawing enhancements. They consolidated the commands. So if you look at the lower left screenshot in NX10, you see track drawing changes with several commands. There's the create snapshot data, um, track changes, settings, be able to execute a report, open a report, overlay. Whereas in NX11, you see it's just two commands track the changes and then overlay. So they've done some work with the reports that get executed. They've also enhanced the change symbols so you can have the the ID or it flag and, and actually show on the, the drawing as a symbol or a balloon of what's changed. What's really neat is that it's actually there's actually a drawing compare functionality meaning we can do one file to another so we could have a revision of one drawing and compare to a, another revision or another drawing and truly do a drawing compare. So the bottom bullet there you can see it can be in a previous version, within the same session, or even between different part files and revisions. So we'll take a look at some of that. Um, secondary geometry representations. You can use this idea to emphasize components in a drawing view. You can display certain components as reference, for example, or what we're going to call secondary components. Basically, these secondary components have the ability to have their own line colors or widths or font or basically their own style. So in the screenshot you see the part in blue which is going to be our primary geometry or primary component and then secondary geometry will be our secondary component or components that maybe we're saying hey these are reference. These are just here to kind of show how the primary geometry fits or displays. To do different formats or different line types in the past you maybe have used render sets. So there's three options that go along with this. One being able to process the secondary geometry or process the secondary geometry. There's an option to process the secondary geometry hidden by a primary geometry. So basically you're creating two different select sets. One of primary geometry and one of secondary geometry within that view. And then there's primary geometry hidden by secondary geometry. So you see there will be a hidden line style and a visible line style for each of those techniques to process the, the lines. You get feedback if something is a secondary geometry representation. You can turn on a column in your navigator, your assembly navigator. You get a little symbol if it's secondary geometry. This would mean that the component is globally marked in the drawing as secondary geometry. So no matter what view we create, that would be a secondary geometry part or component, if you will. And view specific means that the component's global secondary geometry status has been overridden in one or more views. So maybe in a top view, you have it as a a secondary component but maybe not in other views. So we'll take a look at that. Some arrangement enhancements for drafting. You can now edit an arrangement after the view has been placed. Now this is a popular one. So after that view has been 
place. You can just go back in and edit and pick a different arrangement. There's also an option you can turn on for a no arrangement setting as you see there in the right screenshot. View break enhancements. You can automatically add foreshortening symbols. Foreshortening symbols were new in NX10. So what that'll do is if we just place a dimension and we then go in and add a, a view break, it'll automatically add that foreshortening symbol. Whole callout enhancements, as I mentioned earlier, there's a create secondary dimension for depth option added. So if we're doing a linear dimension and with the call out or the, the whole callout, if you see there in the right, instead of having the depth embedded in the callout, it'll automatically add different depth dimensions depending on, on what pieces of our whole callout are displayed. In this case, I have the thread depth and the the whole depth there. That's why I have two of those vertical dimensions, the 0.3 and the 0.5. Display PMI cutting plane and drafting view. So if we've taken the time to create a PMI section view and we've pulled that over to the drawing or drafting, you can now derive that section line. So inside the section line command, there's a new derived option. If you make a change in the model to the PMI cutting plane, those changes will be reflected in the associated section line in the drawing view, the drafting view. And finally, being able to convert drawing objects and views to PMI. This is pretty slick. Um, you, what you see here is in the upper left hand corner you see a drawing. It's a drawing of a particular model. The model does not have any PMI information in there meaning 3D dimensions and annotations. So what you can do is say convert these views and entities from the drawing and go ahead and drop those model views and PMI in there um, in your model. So this would for one be a nice tool if your company switching over to model based definition you know dimension on the model directly and you already have a bunch of legacy prints and drawings done you can take that information and project it over to the model. So we'll take a look at that. Alright, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at a few of these items. Uh, the first thing we'll look at is the drawing compare tool. I'm going to go ahead and open up a drawing. Notice I have a drawing that's a Rev A and a Rev B, so technically different drawing files or part files. Let's go ahead and open up the Rev A first. You'll see that there's a particular arrangement of this assembly on here. Um, obviously, there's some notes and dimensions. I want you to notice this 20 dimension here for Rev A and this arrangement here. If I go ahead and open up Rev B, you'll see it has a different arrangement and there's a basic tolerance on that dimension around the 20. So if we come up here to drafting tools, you'll see the newly packaged drawing compare tools. It's just track drawing changes and visual overlay. If I go into track drawing changes, I can do another drawing which allows me to go to another PRT file which is pretty slick. Um, active drawing snapshot data which is kind of what we did in NX10 where we would create a snapshot and compare uh, the previous uh, snapshot of the drawing versus what we have now. And then if I've saved a report, and I'll show you how a report creates here in a minute, this would be how I'd go back into an existing drawing and look at an existing report. I'm going to go ahead and grab another drawing. So right now I'm in Rev B. I'm going to go ahead and find Rev A. You may notice in NX11 a lot of the loaded parts, dialogues, like in this case track drawing changes or add component, you can search in your loaded part files, which makes it nice if you have a long list. So I'm going to go ahead and grab Rev A. Now it tells me that a snapshot does not exist for the selected part Rev A. So it's going to go ahead and create that for me. So if you look up here, this is truly a drawing compare tool. You have drawing 1, Rev B, drawing tool Rev A. There's a summary about the version and date and time and what file it is, how many sheets, how many views. Just basically a count of what, what's being compared. Then if something changed or something differs, it'll tell us in this table. 
if there's something changed with the view, if something changed with the dimension, if something changed with the annotation, if something was added to one of the files, if something was removed to one of the files. Then in the report, and basically all this is a report, you see that it's listed per sheet. In this case, I only have one sheet drawings, but if I had multiple sheet drawings, I'd sheet, sheet one, sheet two, etc. So down here, you just see everything categorized. For example, the views, I can keep expanding this, and it tells me it has something to do with the arrangement. And drawing one, it's using this arrangement, one bracket, two shafts. Drawing two, it's using two brackets, um, seven shafts. So if I go ahead, I can navigate to that object, and that's what's different about this view. I can come through here and kind of check and check and see, you know, kind of make a check of what I've looked over and reviewed. If I come down here and look at dimensions, you'll see dimension one here. It says it's a tolerance type that's different about it between drawing one and drawing two. Here it says it's basic. Here it says it's no tolerance. If I go ahead and navigate to that, that's that 20 um, dimension that we were talking about. Also, you'll notice that there's a rev ID, one, two, as I go down through the list. What that's going to give me the ability to do if I have the option turned on to do so is go ahead and give these differences rev IDs. I'm going to go ahead and save this report. If I hit close, it would prompt me to save it. I forgot to hit save. But if I come up here and look at the drafting preferences, come down here underneath. Uh, our drawing compare on report this is what it's talking about with that symbol it's called a change symbol so I can display that and that's why this balloon shows up with a rev ID of one if I turn that off I wouldn't see the balloons I can preserve the change symbol display is created with each new drawing comparison report Here's where I would change the way those balloons or those symbols look like, whether it's a triangle, circle, octagon, color schemes, etc. If I want to go back to a report, I just go back to track changes, and now I can say open a saved comparison report. And then I can just get right back to where I was. So that's what it looks like with the drawing compare. If I want to go ahead and do the overlay, I can do the visual overlay. I'm going to go ahead and grab the same Rev B. I guess Rev A, sorry, Rev B is what I have open. So it says there's no overlay, overlay data. You want to go ahead and create some, yes. And just like you'd expect, it's going to create that overlay data, that CGM and we can actually look in here you know and compare through the overlay <clears throat> so just quickly here you can see the overlay where we had the difference in the views over here with the uh, arrangements the note moved a little bit obviously we saw the dimension and just basically the overlay like you would expect The next thing we want to talk about is the concept of secondary geometry. So here I just have a, a drawing started, a master model to drawing here of an assembly of this drill assembly. <clears throat> the first thing let's do, let's go ahead and just put a base view in here. Ignore the concept of secondary geometry so far. I'm just going to grab a front, front view and a certain arrangement. Just drop this in here. All right, so right now that is just you know like we'd expect. Everything has the same line type, same line color, same line width and thickness, and so forth. First of all, let me come over here and turn off monochrome. So there's that default blue. And just like you'd expect, if I come into my drafting preferences, like we've always done, I could come in here and globally change. You know, what's my visible lines going to look like, what's my hidden lines going to look like, and so forth. And probably most of, the, most of you have this set up in a template or a drafting standard. Let me come down here and change. If I'm going to change that, let me change my 
smooth edges to black as well. All right, now I've already placed that view. That's why it's still blue and didn't update. But if I come back in here to the settings of the view, I can go ahead and inherit my settings from the preferences for this view. So now it inherited black to match my drafting preferences. So nothing new there, just looking at the styles of, of the lines, in this case the visible lines. So the secondary geometry concept, like I said during when we went through the slides, is the idea of being able to put emphasis on something, right? Make something reference, be able to control different components in your view to look differently. Um, maybe some of you have used, uh, <coughs> excuse me, used render sets in the past um, to do that. So what we can do with the secondary geometry is if I look at my assembly structure and I come over here and look at the housing, for example. Maybe the housing I just want to be displayed as some kind of reference, right? I'm really focused on other areas of that view more specifically more other or the other components in that view so I'm going to come in here and select those parts and if I just right click on them and go to properties there's a drawings tab and there's an option in here that says that we can just toggle these components as secondary geometry it basically just tags it you can turn on a column which lets you know that this housing subassembly in this case and all these components are secondary or are tagged as secondary geometry in a specific view. Alright, so now if I come back up here and do another base view, and actually before we do that, let me go into my drafting preferences. And if you look in your drafting preferences, there is an area for secondary geometry. How are you going to process secondary geometry? First of all, are you going to process it? And then secondarily, how do you want to process it? Do you want to have a color scheme for secondary geometry hidden by the primary components? Do you want a certain process of primary components and how they're hidden by secondary geometry? And you see, based on what we've turned on, we can have different color types to match. So right now, my secondary geometry, whatever is tagged as secondary geometry will show up with this brown visible line type or brown um, hidden line type. So we'll go ahead and set up those to process. Now when I go into my base view command, I'm just going to grab the same front view, same arrangement. If you look down here, there's a, a group called secondary geometry components. So there will be primary components, and there will be secondary components. Secondary components will be everything that was tagged um, with that option. So it looks like there's 11 components here. If I click, click this step, you see that was everything that we had um, tagged earlier. So all I'm going to do is go ahead and place this view. Okay, so as this view looks, or as this view places, what you'll notice is we had our primary components, which will match, you know, our basic out of the box or what we have set up in our drafting preferences, the black and black in this case, and then everything that was tagged secondary will have that brown color to it, which we're considering like a reference idea. So you notice the housing has that different line type, different width, different color. All right now, if I want to make changes to that, maybe I wanted to change and add some other components. So if I come back in here and edit the view, when we place the view, we just use what was tagged as secondary in the properties. But you'll see here there is the ability to select more parts. So I'm going to come up here, the battery pack and down here in the electrical and I'm going to go ahead and add the battery pack as well as this trigger switch. So if we come over here and update the view what you'll notice is the battery pack down here at the bottom in this little trigger right here 
will also turn to my secondary scheme or or that particular line type or reference if you will So you see that that was added with it. We just added more parts to the secondary geometry. If we come over here and look at the settings, right? I could come in here just like anything else, where you change your visible line types, etc., and I could go grab another color. So right now, this particular view, we've changed our secondary visible line type color to green, but only for this view, right? In the drafting preferences, this is still the brown. All right, let's uh, come up here and place another view. I'm going to do a front view. This time I'm going to do a different arrangement and just put it up here for comparison purposes. All right, so if you look at this base view, this had my default secondary component selected, right, which is what matched what I had initially, those first 11, before I added the trigger and, and the battery subassembly. So what you can do up here underneath update views is I can come in and use this command, secondary geometry and view. I can pick multiple views they'll tell me that the select sets for secondary components are different I could go through here and pick primary versus secondary but if I click this button right here it's going to grab the original 11 that we tagged in the, the properties so right click properties on um, secondary geometry so if I go ahead and hit OK and update this view what's going to happen is the components that are listed secondary geometry is going to match what we had out of the box. When I say out of the box, what we originally tagged in the properties of those files. Now this view down here still has the green color scheme for secondary geometry, but obviously I can come back here in the settings and go look at my drafting preferences and that will update to go back to the original um, orange there you see on the screen. So like I said, you may be used to using render sets where you define a, a set of elements and then apply a certain style to them. Um, here you can base it more on the component and per view um, with the concept of secondary geometry. All right, the next thing we want to take a look at are enhancements to arrangements in drafting. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to another file. All right, so here I just have a drawing. This is a drawing of a particular assembly. Let me go ahead and make this aircraft assembly the, uh, the display part so you see what we're working with. There are different arrangements. So I have a three seat configuration and a four seat configuration. So if I come back over to the drawing, nothing new here in either the view creation wizard or the base view command it understands that that assembly has an arrangement and we can obviously grab um, the arrangement. Here I'll use the view creation wizard and just kind of step through the wizard and maybe I start off with the three seat configuration and I don't know let's do a, a front view here and, and just drop that front view. Very similar if I go into base view uh, let's grab a, another front view just for comparison. Three seats, scale this down. Obviously, it's the same view, but I use the base view command. So one of the enhancements that I think is really nice is just the fact that I can come in here and edit this view and get right back in here and now change my arrangement. So now that's the, the four seat, same thing here. Just to repeat, if I change my arrangement, come in here and update that view. Right, I no longer have to recreate that view. 
All right, so let's come up here, and I'm just going to open up a new drawing. Just grab this. So it's a longer part. Um, first of all, in NX10, the ability to add a foreshortening symbol was was there, was enhanced or added. So what we're going to look at is the option. So if I come up here to my drafting preferences, and come up here and for this break, for a view break, I can come up here and automatically add a foreshortening symbol to dimensions. So it'll automatically do it. So for example, if we come up here and apply a dimension to the overall length, do that again. So if I come up here and add this 85 dimension, you know, maybe I add another dimension down here. Obviously this dimension isn't going to be across the view break where this 85, because it's the total length of the part, will be across the view break. So right now it's just your normal 85 no foreshortening symbol. If I come into this view and add a view break, and I'll just make it associative here and associative there, something like that's fine. Notice when I add that view break, it automatically adds a foreshortening symbol. It is fully associative. So if I come over here and look at the view break and I suppress or unsuppress that, notice how it either adds or removes that foreshortening symbol. So just trying to streamline that workflow. Obviously, this dimension down here wasn't across the break, so it didn't add a foreshortening symbol. Some whole callout options. Um, let me switch over to another part. All right, so here I just have a couple threaded holes. So if I do the linear option with whole callout, let me go ahead and load, uh, fully load this part. So if I go to whole callout, first of all, I look at the settings. I want to make sure that for a threaded hole, I have thread depth on here. I have depth, but I wanted to add thread depth. So if I come up here and grab this particular hole, right? obviously it has my thread, it has the thread depth as well as the hole depth. You can also do this create secondary dimension for depth, which is new in NX11. So what that does, whenever I click on that hole, it will automatically break it out like this. It will have my thread call out and then it will actually dimension the depth, in this case the thread depth, and, this, and then here the whole depth, just like here, but just formatting it um, with depth dimensions. So that's new in NX11 as well. Alright, and finally here, if you look at this drawing, there's obviously several views set up here with uh, quite a few dimensions. We want to look at the ability to take this drafting view information, drafting dimension information, annotations, and be able to take this over to the referenced model and make it PMI. This is pretty slick. First of all, if I go ahead and look at the part, you'll notice I do have a master model drawing, so I have a drawing of a part. If I make this the displayed part, there is no PMI in here. There's no PMI filter. There's no PMI underneath model views, just our base model views. So let me switch back over to the um, drawing. Now here when I do this, I am doing this with master model. If you have non-master model drawing set up, meaning the drawing and the model is in the same file, you could create a new master, master model drawing, so like a new drawing of that part, and copy your views from your non-master drawing sheet over to your new master drawing sheet to do this. It's just a simple copy and paste. But if I come up here 
and run this convert to PMI. I have my preview on so it's highlighting the views and it's also highlighting the dimensions and annotations. So this is what we want to take over and apply to our existing model. If you notice, if we look in here, there's a couple dimensions. There's a dimension here, this 136 dimension, and this 24.6, which isn't highlighted. And the reason why this is highlighted is what it's telling us is it doesn't know what face to snap to in the 3D environment. So let me cancel this and let's take a look at these dimensions. So if I come over here and edit this dimension, and I look at the first object, we notice it's picked up to the center of a face here, which is good. If I look over here, it's actually just picked up on a, on a theoretical intersection or a corner point or whatever it is. So I'm just going to redefine this to the face. And then we'll look over here at this other dimension. It's got the first object. Let's make sure that we snap that to a face. And then second object. Actually, I switched those up. Let's try that again. So we got first object and then second object. I'll just go ahead and put over here. I kind of messed it up, but that's okay. So it snapped to the faces. So now if I do my convert to PMI, it's grabbing this dimension and this dimension as well. So what I'm going to do is just hit OK. And after that, if we come over here and look at the actual part, the model, notice all that came across as PMI. If I look at specific model views, Notice any detail view or different view we had in drafting is now a model view over here in modeling. So if I just make some of these to work view, you see there's dimensions associated with that view. Right? It just brought it over as PMI objects, which is pretty slick. If I come over here and look at right, there's a lot of detail here. Even the section section planes come across as PMI <coughs> excuse me, PMI sections. So that's pretty slick. So if you are if your company's working towards model-based definition where you're going to use PMI, meaning 3D dimensions and annotations, and you do have legacy drawings, this um, tool to be able to take drawing objects, views, etc., and take it over and create PMI information in your model, which is pretty neat. Alright, other things I want to mention here quickly, um, convergent modeling and the print 3D command. Convergent modeling, this is this is pretty pretty handy, especially if you're working with facets or STL files. Um, just a note, look for a dedicated lunch bite from Ally PLM coming up at the end of the year. NX Design can work with facets now just like any other geometry. The output from the operation is a facet. So if we brought in an STL file and created a solid, maybe a block, we can now subtract that STL file from that target or that solid block. This, this expands the possibility to use NX in more of the process, especially reverse engineering process, direct use of early polygon models, and direct use of scans from tooling. So just, just keep that in mind. That's new in NX11, and there will be a more detailed presentation from Ally on that coming soon. Also, just a mentionable item, print 3D. There's a file 3D print command. In NX11, it sends the model directly to 3D printer from NX. It uses the Microsoft 8.1 slash 10 toolkit. So in this session we completed what's new in CAD part 2. We looked at what's new in sheet metal, assemblies, drafting, PMI, and other. And like I said a couple weeks ago we completed the, the first session part 1 where we looked at what's new in user interface, sketching, modeling, and synchronous modeling. If you want more information on what's new just go to your help, the what's new guide, and you can browse by category. 
Also, something else to mention, if you do the rendering, the photorealistic rendering inside of NX, there's some nice enhancements inside that environment as well. So check those out. Um, as always, our replays, we're uploading those to um, YouTube and our website. So you can go see your, the rest of our, our um, videos that we have in our library. Upcoming NX training classes, if you're interested in any of our CAD or CAM classes, all of them can be taught online. Go to our website for more information. And thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope you found this session informative. If you have any suggestions for future Lunch Bite topics, you can request those through our website. We're starting to schedule topics for next year. Actually, I'm working on the schedule currently, and we can look at those. And once again, remember that this Lunch Bites was two sessions. Uh, we completed it in this session, and then a couple weeks ago, the part one was completed. So once again, thanks for your time, and have a great afternoon. L -I -P -L -M.